Hello and welcome to another tutorial. So what we're going to be setting up this time around is a font manager. So the idea behind what a font manager does is it's something that, you know, in a game we often set up lots and lots of bits of text scattered across lots of different scenes and screens throughout. Uh, so there's a lot of different areas where we will have stuff set up. And there you know, are often cases where we might need to easily be able to go and change all of that text. And some really sort of key important ones there when, uh, when we're starting to look at options for making our games more accessible. So making it so that more people can play and enjoy our games, which is, is the goal. We, you know, we're making these things for people to enjoy them, so we want to make them that as many people can play them and can get a good, enjoyable experience out of it. So if we have a central font manager, that can make it easier for us to do things like increase the size of fonts globally. So we can make stuff that's then easier for folks to read. Uh, we can also do stuff there where we could switch to different fonts because while well, there are you know, cases where we might want to in a game have very particular fonts because from an aesthetic point of view, it fits the aesthetic of the game or that area and it enhances it. Those fonts aren't always easy to read. And that's something that can be a real problem if you've got text where, you know, yep, it looks cool. It fits very much with the theme of in world. But if a chunk of your player base can't read it or can't easily read it, either because of the sort of structure of the font itself or because of how rapidly it's placed on the screen, that's not good. We want stuff to be easily accessible. So things like of a font manager are a way that we can do that. They're a way that we can actually make stuff easier for people to be working with. So let's dive on in. And so this is actually going to be somewhat based upon uh, the font manager I set up for the Eternal Collector. Uh, it's not part of the template library yet. I do intend to make that as part of my template project though. So the idea is, is we want to be able to easily build up a database in a scriptable object of all of the text and then be able to patch that. We also want to be able to, because we might have dynamic UI, be able to dynamically register text for it to update. So first thing I'm going to need to do is I actually need a bunch of text in my UI. Uh, so I'm going to set up, so we'll create a panel at first. I will make the background a solid color so things are a little bit easier to see. And then I'm just going to create a bunch of different blocks of text in different locations, things like of that. I'll bring in Text Mesh Pro. So I'm going to design this specifically for Text Mesh Pro. It's pretty much the default now in Unity. So that's what it's going to use. But the process that I use for this, you could use for other ones if you're needing to. Uh, so, you know, we might have some title text. So we're going to then have a description. Uh, we might also have a panel of controls. Uh, so these might be some controls that will chuck in a couple of buttons. Uh, so this will be something where we can have in buttons that will do things like uh, default, larger, so we can actually go and have things that will be changing the text. So default display, large fonts. Now we're just using a single option here, but we could set up multiple ones if we wanted. So I'm gonna park these down the bottom. So that pause Y can drop like that. Uh, doesn't need to be that high, maybe 150. And we'll also give it a horizontal layout group uh, where it can expand the height of the child like that. Uh, now I'm also going to do my usual change with UI where we scale with screen size like that, which is good. Uh, now our panel, 
to make sure that pivot, whoops, not for that one, that one's fine. Uh, panel for our controls, the Y should be zero, so that it looks like that. And it's gonna be a bit smaller, and we don't need to force expand the width, and we'll give these, again, a little bit of padding. So that looks good. Our title text, and these are really just placeholder ones that we're getting set up so that we can have a few different things of different sizes as well. Uh, so I might make that quite large. Center it. And then finally, we have our descriptive text here, uh, which I will just have it be set up like that. Can have it expand. Can use five, probably 150. And then we need actually a whole bunch of text to throw into that ideally. Uh, so this is where, you know, if you, need uh, text, we can go for good old uh, lorem ipsum and just actually dump that in. Uh, so that will just give us a chunk of text. And I'm actually going to put that in a couple of times just so we've got enough stuff there to be taking up the space because uh, actually that's probably enough for us to test. So okay, that's good. We've got this set up. We can now start to set up the components we need for our font manager. So we're going to have our font manager. Now it's going to have a couple of sections to it. So there's going to be the actual font manager itself. Now the font manager itself doesn't actually end up needing to do too much. So it's going to be something that would be present in the level. So we will have an empty object that will put the font manager on. So the font manager sits in the level. Alongside that, we have the actual registry for it. So we have the font manager database or registry. So this is the, what's going to actually hold sort of the core data. And just so we're getting everything created while we need it, we are going to need an editor script for that database. So we're going to create another script just so we've got everything created. So really just going and creating all of the files uh, at once, just so we can then start setting these up. So font manager, we'll have a link to the database. The database is going to be the actual thing that holds uh, the key data. So this is going to need some code that runs editor side, some code that runs game side, which is okay. That's something that we can very easily do. Uh, what we need to do for that is, okay, we're going to set up so that we have an F unity editor and an end if. And I always like to put a, a comment there like that, just to make it clear. So there's gonna be a couple of things that this is gonna to need to be doing. It is gonna be a scriptable object which means it gets a create asset menu, menu name, font manager, database, and we can give it the file name, font manager db. We get rid of our start and update. So the core thing this needs to store is it needs to store, well, here's a bit of text here is the font that it used. Here is the size that it used and be able to switch that. And it needs to have something that this needs to be able to work across scenes. So there's different ways we could go about approaching this. Now, how, how we approach this, 
I would, what I, what I've found is because we generally aren't reorganizing the UIs a huge amount, what I would do is you can use where something is located in the hierarchy effectively as a path. Now that does mean things have to be uniquely identified. That's okay, because the other alternative is trying to you know, use modified versions of Text Mesh Pro. That makes our workflow a bit messier. Adding in sort of additional annotations, again, a bit messier. This way is one that I've found seems to work. Now there obviously is potential we reorganize UIs, data becomes invalid. That is that is a risk with it. Uh, but I found that that tends to be less of a workflow issue because we can just fix things by doing a rebuild. Because the font manager database, we're generally not manually editing the entries. So bring, needing to rebuild it is actually okay. It's something we could even do potentially as a build tool process. Um, so I think it's okay to do that rebuilding. So we need to store the entries. So we're going to set up a serializable class. So this is referring to text that we manage. So it's going to be our managed text. Or we could call it our text entry. So our managed text entry. So it needs a path. It needs to know the actual font asset. So I'm going to bring in TM Pro because what this would have is a public TMP font asset. And then that's going to be the default font. We need the size, default size. And that looks pretty good. So, okay, that'll be the entries. So our font manager database actually then stores. So we can do a serialized field and we have a list of managed text. And I'll refer to this as managed text. So that looks pretty good. Now we also might end up needing to support dynamically bound ones is a possibility. Uh, we'll have a look at how we can do that, but first we'll get this text up and running. So, okay, we need to build up this database. I want to be able to add in these entries. So if remember, I set up the editor script for this. Now the editor one, it's actually really, really simple. Because all it's going to do we add in a unit using unit editor, tell it that this is an editor, and we need to tell it that this is a custom editor for the type of font manager DB. Now, all we need to do is a public override, and this is our uh, drawing the on inspector GUI. So we've got that. We do actually just want to run the base one because all we're doing is we're just adding in a button. So I want to do a GUI layout button. And we're going to have populate managed fonts. And this is going to retrieve the font manager database, which we can do just by casting like that. And I can go DB populate managed text. So I'll refer to that as managed text. So very little of what we're doing here. We just need to, we're just using this to uh, provide that function. Now I could do a lot of the actual logic for processing and doing the addition in here in the custom editor. I usually prefer not to, and I'd actually recommend not doing that. I think it's better to do that inside the object that you're actually updating the data for means you don't need to go and, you know, otherwise I'd need to make stuff like of this public or provide a lot more interfaces. You end up writing a lot more code if you put it into the actual editor itself. Uh, so what I would do is I usually will set up a button and then a function in here. You just have to make sure that you wrap it in this, checking that it's only running within the Unity editor. 
otherwise, if you have editor code and you then go and try and do a build, that build is actually going to fail. So you can't build uh, editor code into your actual application. That won't work because uh, the editor effect effectively doesn't exist. So, okay, we now need to find all of the text that we can currently see. And that's actually pretty straightforward for us to do because there's dedicated objects of what we're looking for. So it's actually quite easy for us to do. So that's what we'll do to start off with. We'll find all of the GUI text. So all GUI text, we can go find objects of type. And we could provide then text mesh pro you GUI. Now you'll see there's two versions of this and we actually want to include inactive ones. So if something's been turned off, we need to include it so that we make sure we get that. So this will traverse all GUI text. So that to do that, then okay, for GUI text in all of that. So we can loop over all of these. So to build up the path, that's actually the first thing we need to do. So I'm going to actually put that potentially as a little helper function here. So string build path to. And I want to give it the particular game object. So game object. And we'll just call this child or target object. So I want to get that path. So to assemble that path, well, okay, I'm going to set up a string path. So the starting point for it is actually going to be the object's name. So the target's name, and at the end we'll return path. So the idea is, is this is just like a directory path, except it goes through the scene. So we can store the parent. So the parent, we go target transform parent. Then what we want to do is as long as that parent is valid, we keep going higher up the hierarchy. So while parent is not equal to null, then I can add in that path. So I can say, okay, well path, I can just use our string interpolation and we go parent game object name. And what you use as a separator is entirely up to you. I would recommend just sticking with using like a forward slash stand, tends to be sort of the, the usual convention we would go for. So we do that, then we go parent like that. So we keep walking up the hierarchy until we run out. And once we get to the very top, we then are at the scene. So we can actually get the name of the scene that we're in. So we can then, as a final thing, add in, we can say, okay, well, target, game object, well actually target already is a game object, so we can do target scene name. So we can add that in, and we're going to add that in with an actual different separator, like that. So that will give us the actual path to something. So we've got a helpful way of being able to actually store the path. So okay, I can go path get our uh, we'll build path to and we just go GUI text dot game object so that's good we'll have the path for it then we need to set up our new manage text entry so by entry is a new managed text entry and then I can populate the different things. So path, well, we've already got that. I can set up the default font. Well, that's our GUI text and I can access the font asset, which is just font. 
and then I can also access the size. So default size is our GUI text dot font size. So that's good. We've got our entry store. Now we could just add it directly into the list, but what if we've already got things in that list? We might need to update it. So we actually need to do a little bit of wrapping logic because we don't, we want to, if it's already there, overwrite it. We don't want to add it again. And we don't want to remove stuff that might be from a different scene. So populate should add an update, but it shouldn't be removing a bunch of things. So what I actually want to do is have a dictionary that's going to be keyed off of the path and it will have a managed text entry. So this will be our managed text map. And that's going to be a new dictionary. And I'm going to, as the very first thing, populate our existing text into it. So all of this existing managed text, I will actually add in. So we'll go manage text map, entry path is equal to entry. So what we're doing is set up a map of the current text. So we just want that because if we already have an entry, we can then check and see, okay, well, if managed text map contains key, for that path. So we've got two options of what we could do with this. We could overwrite or we could ignore. So, or we could update or ignore. So I'm going to give this uh, update existing, which I'll default to true, or we'll go for update if already exists. So if it contains it, so actually what we're looking for is if it doesn't contain it, or if we're updating it, if it already exists, then I would do manage text map path is entry. So we just store that entry in. So that looks good. We could also move this down to here just so we're not newing it and in a, in a case where we potentially wouldn't need to. Uh, so add in if not present or if updating is false, which I might actually default that to false. It's probably better to not force update it. So, okay, we've put every, put those into a map. Well, that's, the text mesh pro you GUI ones. What if we had in world text? So we could have in world text as well. So those are uh, in world text, find objects of type. So we need to work out what the type is. Now I've used a lot of ones where you know we, we, we're sort of very familiar with it. We've placed the text in the GUI, so I know it's the Text Mesh Pro one. But with this, I think it's TMP text, but I'm not 100% sure. So if you're not 100% sure, how do we check? So what I would do is I will actually add one in. So under 3D object, add in a text, and then I need to see the script. So what I can do is on that control, I can go and select edit script. And what I'm looking for is, okay, and I can see I was actually wrong. So TMP text is the base class. This should actually be text mesh pro. So we can then go and fix this to be retrieving ones like that. So this, I will just call in-world text. I will reduce the size of that because that is just ridiculous. Uh, but we will move it over and down. Uh, in-world text. 
looks good. So it gives us something that we know can be being updated there as well. So the logic actually ends up being the same. Now, potentially, depending upon what these inherit from, so they both inherit from TMP text. So we actually could just search for that base class. And that would actually probably do the trick. So I'm just going to switch it to that. And this will become all TMP text. So handy thing with find objects of type, you can actually search for a base class. So in this case, we're getting all text mesh pro text and it will just do it all in one go. So that's good. We've retrieved all of that. Now we need to store this data. So, okay, how I would go about storing it. Well, to make it a bit easier if we're looking through it, because we might need to, I'm going to get all of the paths first. So we go manage text map, we get our keys. And what I want to then do is I want to actually sort those. So that's going to be a new list of strings. And I want to do all paths, sort. So we get the sorted keys, and then I'm going to populate that list. So, okay, we can then update our entry here. So our managed text is a new list. We know how long it's going to be, so we can actually put in the count. So we can pre-allocate. Then we add the text in. So path in all paths. So then we go, okay, well, managed text. We add and we go from our map at that path. So set up a sorted version of the text or store sort of version of the text. Now the final thing we need to make sure we remember and do, because we're working in the editor, so we need to tell it that things have changed. So we have to actually go register, and I'm going to register a complete object undo, because what we've done is completely change it. Populate manage text. Now we also make sure we flag it as dirty. What that does is that means that it knows this needs to actually be saved. And I'm actually just going to force a save at this point. Uh, so we could do save asset F30. And that should just save the file. So this should actually be able to build up that list, which once it's got it built up, then we can actually start working with it. So I'm going to create a folder data and we will create our font manager. So we can link that up once we've got the font manager script side there set up. But this, we've got no text in here at the moment. I'm going to tell it to populate. We've got five entries and we can see sample scene, canvas, so we have our individual entries here. It's storing what asset it's talking to, it's storing the current size of it. So we can see all of those setups there for it, which is great. So we can now start to set up our actual font manager. So the font manager currently doesn't do anything but it's going to need that registry. So serialize field. So it's going to have our database, font manager DB. So once it's got that, well, we have our buttons here for default and larger. So, okay, let's implement how we want those to be able to work. So set fonts default. And we might then also have a set fonts larger. 
So this should actually go and we want to look at, okay, well our font manager DB. I'd like to be able to have a synchronize function or a refresh, something like of that, that goes and updates all of the ones. Uh, so we could go set fonts to default or refresh fonts. But we also want to be able to have this control for making them larger. And we want to think about how we want to do this interface here. Because uh, there's a lot of things that we could potentially do. Ideally, what I want is something where I get, I give it, okay, here's the current size. Well, here's the default size. What do you want to change it to? So I want this to be able to, that refresh fonts function, to be able to do different logic. So this is something where what I could do is if I bring in system, then down here I could set up my refresh fonts function. Void, refresh fonts. Then I'm going to say that the parameter here is a func. Now func allows us to create something where you can provide in your own particular function for it. So it's going to have a float in and it will return a float. And this will be our font processing function. And I'm going to default that to null, so you don't have to provide one. Uh, but how we would use this is we would do font processing function, whatever the current size might be, and we would get back a new size. That's how it would actually work. Because uh, that then lets me set up here so different ways, so this I would just actually provide nothing because by default we'll just say that it goes with the default size. Uh, larger, then I could set up a particular function for this. So I could set up you know, what I want this to actually do. There's different ways that I could structure this. I could link it to a particular function. So I could have uh, font processor larger. Uh, so we'd have float in size, well this could be the default size. And what I do is I return default size, we might say we add 25% to it, so multiply it by 1.25. I can just put font processor larger. So it allows us to use the same interface, the same process there in the font DB, but it can do a lot of different things. Now, okay, we need to go and actually traverse this font data and work out how we actually apply the stuff. So there's a couple of ways we could go about approaching it. We could deconstruct the paths and build from there. We also could use quite a bit of this stuff here. So I actually am going to take all of this because all of this is quite a valid thing to be using for it and actually can make our life a fair bit easier. So I can build up this map of all of the text that we've got and I can go through and find all of the things in the game. Now this is something where we do want to be mindful that refresh fonts is not something we would be doing a lot. Uh, it is a slower operation, but it would be something where that's okay because it's something that's user initiated. It's something we should expect it to be slower. It's going to be something that people aren't doing sort of in the middle of an action or combat sequence. So we get the path and we've, so we've got our dictionary of all of our text, makes it a lot easier for us to manage. Uh, we could cache that and only cha and change it then, you know, refresh it only if we switched scene would be stuff we could do. So there are some further things that we'll look at adding at a later point um, for those sort of performance optimizations if we want to. So we've got our map, we've got our text. So it becomes pretty straightforward for actually checking the text here because I can go and look and see 
Okay, well, is this text actually already sort of present? Uh, so what I would do is f uh, managed text map contains a key for that path, then I can update it. So we could be overriding the font. In this case, I'm just changing the uh, particular font size, but I could also be remapping to a different font. So we're just focused on size, but we could also update this uh, functor here. So it was also changing font type as well. Uh, but what we will do is, okay, well, our text entry, so we're going to call this, I will rename these both just so that they're consistent because they aren't really GUI text anymore. So we make sure we're just using appropriate naming for them. So our text mesh pro texts font size is equal to, well, if we have a font processing function, so font processing function is not equal to null, then we run it with that entry. So what I would do is var entry is manage text at that path. So we can grab entry uh, default size. Otherwise we just set it to that default size. The other thing we could also do is we could have a backup font processing function that we swap in here. Uh, that what we could do is float font processing default and we just return default size. That way we can remove doing a conditional check here and we just do this. where what we would do, so it simplifies that logic a little bit, also means we don't need to do that separate retrieving, so it thins down our code a little bit. What I would do is f font processing function is null, then we just swap it to our font processing function default. So f no font processor provided, use the default. And that should do the trick. We should be able to then have this update the font size. Now, as I said, we're not updating the actual uh, font asset yet. Uh, that is something where if I wanted to, so we need to look at when we're setting up a function or functor, if we wanted to have multiple ones, there's a lot of different, you'll see lots of different ones. So we put all of our parameters first. So we could have float like of that, but we also want to then be able to be changing the font. So we could have another functor that just controls with the actual font type as well. So if we did TMP asset font processing, Default, we can give it the same name, potentially. Uh, we'll see how that goes with remapping. It is entirely different parameters, so it should be able to differentiate between it. Uh, so we can have this as be the size function. And then we would have another one that is TMP asset. Just have these here. I might actually bring this onto another line so that we can make it a little bit neater. Call these size processor, font processor. So we can see it is able to properly differentiate, which is good, because we would then do the exact same logic of this. So it makes it that if we need to, we can swap out uh, the font, we've got the interface there for it. Then we do similar sort of thing here. 
This uses default font. And we have the font processor function. So that looks good. I should actually be able to, if I've cleared all of the errors. Uh, so the only thing we might run into is we need to make sure that it's accessing the right uh, type of one here. Oops, that should be font asset. That will do it. That should make it happier. So we're going to, we've populated our database. We will link it up to our font manager. Font manager has its database now. It needs that to be able to do anything. Uh, and we then can link up our buttons here, which they will talk to the font manager and they're going to tell it, okay, well, that can go to default. Larger will link up as well. So this one, just link that over to our font manager. Goes to larger. So let's test this out. And we'll rename us. We won't rename our scene actually because the path would mismatch. So we can run it. So if I go large fonts, all of the fonts increase. So we have it going and changing the fonts which is cool, but that's good for if we've got stuff that's pre-built, which, you know, a lot of things we'll have will be pre-built, but we might have dynamic text as well. So we do want to make sure we can support stuff that might be dynamically spawned. So we need to create a bit of an interface for that. So what we would actually do for something like of that is our font manager I want to give it a way for it to actually be uh, keeping track of dynamic ones. So I'm going to need to first make this a singleton. So I'll have public static font manager instance, publicly gettable, but a private set in a wake. We set instance to this, but we also do our safety check just in case we ended up with multiple ones. So instance is already set to something. We exit. We also destroy the game object that it's attached to so that we definitely clear it away. And we log out an error because this is something that should not happen. Found additional font manager on, and we can just log out the game object's name. So it just means that we can be safe and ensure that there is only one of it present. What that lets us do then is we can now set up a couple of particular functions. Now, things like these larger ones and that, these you'd probably end up moving those to a different location or changing sort of the interfaces there. Those are mostly testing ones. We do want to have our one for, okay, we want to be able to bind to a bit of text. So bind dynamic text, TMP. Now we need to make sure we've got Text Mesh Pro included here. So we bring in Text Mesh Pro. So the idea is, is this can be given any bit of text and it will create a dynamic binding for it. So that is going to go and need to talk to the instance and our font manager database. And it will, again, we push all of the logic of the handling of it into the actual font manager database. So that'll bind a bit of dynamic text. We also might then want to have unbind dynamic text. Same sort of thing, text. So again, we just put all of it going through our font manager database, unbind dynamic text. And we just provide the text. So that's good. So those are two functions we'll set up over in our database. So we've got our font processes, things like of that. The binding I'll put down here. 
these won't be static and obviously they won't then go and uh, try to talk to uh, itself. So dynamic text needs to follow a fairly similar process to the other bits of text, but we want to store it separately. We don't want to put it into this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a dictionary. It's going to have a path. It will still have a manage text entry, and this is going to be our dynamically bound text. I might just, I might just call it dynamic text. So entries will go into this. So what I would do is when we go and work with this, well, I need to get the path. So, okay, path, build path to text game object. Do the same thing for unbind. Now, unbind is easy. Our dynamic text, we remove at that path. That's quite straightforward. Binding, well, what I would do is we would do dynamic text at that path, and it needs a new manage text entry. So similar to what we build up uh, down here, it gets that exact same thing. So it holds the same data, we work with it largely in the same way, and we can grab a bit of text here. So it's grabbing out the font and the font size. So that's good. We should then potentially, you know, we might need to force an update for it. So that's something where, you know, the font manager could uh, kick off an update for a particular bit of text. So that might be a useful thing for, okay, force update and being able to actually tell it, okay, force update, we give it the actual bit of text. We could then build the path to it. And this should actually have these same processes. So it should have those exact same processing functions. So what I would do is give it support for being able to provide those if we're wanting to. And then I need to check that path. So, okay, well, if our dynamic text contains that, then, okay, that's quite straightforward. We can go and kick off its updating. I do want to make sure we bring in these just because we need, it's very easy to miss them. So is this dynamic text? And I'm checking dynamic text first because it's the fastest one to check. It's also the most likely one where we would be doing an individual sort of update. So, okay, if it contains it, well, we use this same logic. So pretty straightforward. We would be using, except rather than manage text map, we use dynamic like that. And we update our text function. If it's not dynamic text, then we need to go through entry in our manage text, and we're looking for that particular one. Uh, now we could you know, go and just use its current size. We do need to, so we need to check that the path matches. So if entry path matches, we do our same bit of updating. And we would go entry, uh, and that needs to go through our size processor function, so we change that, like that, and we would just do a return. So it's good. We've got something that can handle dynamic text. When we do a refresh of all text, we actually should do the same thing here. So it should do for each var, uh, and then what we would check is, so it's not just the manage text map, we would also check 
Otherwise, if our dynamic text contains that key, then we can update it. But we use the dynamic text map. Because the text has to actually exist, so there's no point traversing the dynamic text one instead. We just use this. So it looks good. That should mean if we dynamically spawn anything, that it will update as well. So what I could do, just as a bit of a test for that, uh, and I will put this in a separate folder. So we'll have a bit of text here, spawn extra buttons. So I'll spawn some extra stuff down here. So what I'm going to do is just add that onto the controls here. And this is going to just spawn in a few extra ones. So we'll just give it a prefab. Name object. And this will be our button prefab. Uh, num to spawn. So we just want to throw in a bunch of additional ones here. So what we would do, uh, we'll give it a transform so it knows where to be spawning these as well. Button root. So we'll do an instantiate of the button prefab at button root. New button like that. I need to get the text though then. So do new button, get component in children. Find the text, so text mesh pro TMP text. And then I need to tell our font manager, so font manager and bind dynamic text. And we give it that. So on start, this will add in a bunch of extra buttons. I'll create a bit of a prefab for it. Uh, so that num to spawn, we want to make sure it does spawn up to that number. So index is less than num to spawn. That will just give us multiple ones, just so we can see that it's working with multiple things bound to it. Should work regardless of the number of ones, but just ensures that it's reliably working. Uh, I'm just going to chuck in a new button, uh, which this button, I am going to actually make the font size a little bit smaller intentionally. So we'll set up a prefab and we can get rid of that. Our controls, we can link that up. We tell it where it needs to spawn this. So we do have the dynamic binding in. So these ones, when I go and say large fonts, they increase. They also can go back to the default. So we have something that's working we're, regardless of sort of the size there. Now we're only using the, the one sort of font. Uh, we could set up so that we were switching to other fonts very easily with it. Uh, we do by default, we only have sort of the one, the one font that's in there. So you could easily though swap in a processor that's switching to a different font. Um, so for example, I use this in a lot of my games for being able to switch to a font that's a bit more dyslexia friendly. Uh, so really easy to be doing this. So this gives us our font manager. Now, worst case, say we rename the scene. Okay. Font manager demo level. You can reload. Now our database will be out of date. If we go and run this, the fonts won't change. These dynamic ones will, but everything else stays the same. So that's something where that's okay. All we would do is remove them, repopulate. It's got the new fonts, the new scene name. So we've designed it to make it pretty easy 
uh, to update if we need to, and then it's back working. So this is something where it's set up. If you want to add this into your own projects, should be very easy to bring those in. Um, you should be able to have it work with already an existing text or being able to have it work with dynamic text. So it means that you've just got something there that makes it really easy to just blanket change all of the text in a way that's going to be really straightforward from a setup point of view, which was the goal. Thanks folks, I hope you found the video interesting and helpful. If you have, chuck in a like and subscribe, it really helps out, it's really appreciated. If you're looking for the code for the project, the code is available up on GitHub, and I've placed a link to that in the description below. You can use that code in any of your own projects, commercial, non-commercial ones. Uh, if you're trying to find other related videos, I do have a link also to a video archive. It's a searchable archive of all of the videos where you can search based upon the descriptions. And they're also grouped into a lot more different categories so you can easily find things. If you have any questions, chuck in a comment below. And if you're looking for other ways to support the channel, then I do have a Patreon, and there's a link to that in the description as well. But until next time, bye.